Hi everybody, this is Domina Schmiller, and I'm going to be your host of the new podcast, Nightcap with a True Crime Recap. Every week I'm going to be coming to you in the evenings with a nightcap, usually whiskey is my favorite, and we're going to be talking about a true crime event that happened in Newburytown and the surrounding areas. So this evening we're going to be talking about a murder that happened in 1891, and it was a mystery that gripped Lewisbury for some time. Elizabeth Strominger was tragically murdered during a home invasion. Elizabeth and her husband, Michael Strominger, are my first cousins four times removed. So I'm going to be reading to you the newspaper articles and the first-hand accounts of the murder. So our first article says, Lewisbury murder, the whole upper end, excited over the tragedy. Mr. Strominger tries to defend his wife, but is quieted by a revolver. How Mrs. Strominger was killed. The robber tries to revive his victim, but life had fled. He sends a doctor, but too late. So our first article is going to say, The murder of Mrs. Michael Strominger at Lewisbury on Tuesday night has thrown the usually quiet section in a torment of excitement. And if the perpetrator of the crime was caught in the present temper of the people, it might not be good for him. A reward of $1,000 is offered for the apprehension of the villain, and it is hoped he may yet be discovered and met with the punishment his crime deserves. The particulars of the sad affair are about as follows. Mr. and Mrs. Michael Strominger, an aged couple, lived in a small house on the outskirts of town. By hard work and thrift and enterprise, they had secured a comfortable competency and were living contented and happily. Last autumn, Mr. Strominger purchased a farm from the heirs of Jonas Miller, deceased, for which he was to pay about $8,000 on April 1st, 1891. The robbers and the murderer must have knowledge of this fact and expected that the old gentleman would have the money in the house Tuesday night to make the payment the next day. Fortunately, the money had already been paid on Monday. While sitting in their home about 8 o'clock on Tuesday night, a man came to the door knocking, and he was admitted. He wore a mask, and the nature of his visit was soon made known. Without parley, he demanded from Mr. Strominger the money which appeared to have a particular knowledge of. The aged husband is an invalid, being terribly afflicted with the dread disease of rheumatism, and he is almost helpless. With the revenue derived from their savings, the aged couple lived in retirement. The old gentleman demurred, however, and was about to resist when the robber held a revolver to his head and threatened to kill him unless he remained quiet. Taking a huge knife out of his pocket, the villain threatened to kill the old lady if she made an alarm. When he bound Mrs. Strominger's hands and feet and wrapped her apron around her head, tying it around the throat very tightly like a rope, She made a desperate effort to protect their belongings and made a bold fight against the burly ruffian. At the point of the revolver, the old man was ordered to get up and show where the money was, and he guided the robber to a back room where he had $1,700 concealed, and from $800 to $1,000 of this, the robber secured. After the money was secured, the robber turned his attention to Mrs. Strominger, who was lying on the floor. Insensible. He carried her to a lounge and, removing the bindings from her wrists and ankles and the apron from her head, endeavored to revive her by dashing whiskey into her face and chafing her hands. To the old gentleman, his wife appeared to be dead, and he said so, but the robber said she was not dead and he would bring her to. He even took a looking glass from the wall and held it to her mouth to see whether she was still breathing. Failing to discover any evidence of life, he told the old man to go for a doctor. Strominger said he was crippled and could not go out and requested the that the robber go for the doctor. The masked man said he didn't know where the doctor lived, but he knew where the blacksmith shop was. And when told the doctor lived directly opposite, he started off. Going to the doctor, he rapped on the door and brought the doctor to answer to the call. He told the doctor he was wanted at Mr. Strominger's and that the old lady was very sick. The doctor in the company of Mr. David Crumlick immediately went to the Strominger's, and on arriving there, he found the old lady dead. Hearing from the old gentleman the story of the robbery and murder, the doctor at once gave alarm, and a crowd of people soon gathered around the premises. In what direction the murderer left after leaving the doctor's office is not known. It is believed that another man was outside of the house on the watch, and that the robber and the murderer were inside, and that he had a team nearby in which they together made their escape. Word was sent to Harrisburg that same night, and the detectives went to work, and telegrams also sent to other cities but at last accounts, no clue of the perpetrators of the outrage had been obtained.
Mr. Strominger describes the murderer as a man of tall build and about as near as he could judge, five feet ten inches high, of sandy complexion and slight build. He was disguised at the time of tying the old lady, and a false beard he had on fell off. The imprint left by his boot tracks was measured the next morning and given at ten and a half inches. The tracks indicated that they were gum shoes or gum boots. Mr. Strominger is about 75 years of age, and his wife Elizabeth was about 63 years old. The old gentleman is badly afflicted with rheumatism and almost helpless, and this person unable to offer any resistance to the robber. The Strominger had a brother living in Harrisburg, Mr. Joseph Strominger, and two sisters, Mrs. Jacob Hewitt of Lewisbury and Mrs. Jacob Elcock, Justice R. P. Strominger of Goldsboro, is a cousin. The funeral of Mrs. Strominger will take place Friday morning at 9 o'clock from the house. The internment will take place at St. John's Lutheran Church at Lewisbury. So there you have a depiction of the crime and what happened to poor Mrs. Strominger. And then, of course, because this was a murder mystery and it wasn't solved right away, we have other articles talking about it. The first one was Resolutions of the Death of Mrs. Strominger. Where is our beloved Sunday school teacher and sister and fellow laborer in Christ, Mrs. Elizabeth Strominger, has been taken from us by the hand of death, where she has been stricken down very suddenly and unexpectedly while in the enjoyment of health and while cheerfully attending to her home duties, and active in church work by the hand of an assassin, therefore. Resolved that in the death of Sister Strominger, our class has lost a kind and devoted teacher, our church a faithful, consistent, and useful member, a pillar of the same, and our community a friend ever ready to sympathize and help where her services were needed and resolved that while we deeply sympathize with the lonely husband and friends at this time of trial and bereavement, and while we feel in the peculiar visitation that mysteries indeed are the ways of providence, we yet bow in humble submission to the divine will, and feeling implicit confidence in our loving Heavenly Father, even in this terrible affliction, that he doth all things well, and pray that we may find comfort in him. Yet we sorrow because we because her noble life has come to such a cruel and untimely end, and we deeply deplore the merciless act and denounce the unmeasured terms, the perpetrators of the cowardly deed, which derived her of life, <clears throat> deprived her of life and cast a deep gloom and sadness over the entire community and all. Resolved that our class attend the funeral in a body, and that her seat be draped in token of our respect and sorrow, and further, that these resolutions be placed on the minutes of the school, and that they be printed in the county papers, and that a copy be given to the husband and friends of the deceased. And this is from Elmira Foster, Carrie Klein, and Amanda Crone, and this was printed in the newspaper. And the next article is Strominger Murder Mystery, Several Arrests of Suspicious by Eagled Eyed, uh, Several Arrests of Suspects. And the next article is Strominger Murder Mystery, Several Arrests of Suspects by Eagled Eyed Detectives. Constable Sean pounced down upon a man at Lebanon, but the prisoner was subsequently released verdict of the coroner's jury, detectives after the reward, and other matters. One of the largest funerals ever held in Lewisbury was that of Mrs. Strominger yesterday noon. Among the relatives present from the city were Mercer's Jacob and Chas Billets, nephews of deceased, owing to the holding of a second inquest of the funeral, was postponed from 9 a.m. until the time above mentioned. The funeral services were held at the Methodist Episcopal Church, and the remains were interned in the St. John's Lutheran Church graveyard. The verdict of the coroner's jury is that Mrs. Elizabeth Strominger came to her death on March 31, 1891, from strangulation by the means of a cord forcibly applied to the neck by the hands of the same person unknown to the jury. Dr. Spangler and Stem conducted the post-mortem examination, which showed that the unfortunate woman died from the effects of the strangulation. Diligent efforts will now be put forth to run to the earth the guilty party or parties and earn the promised joint reward of $1,500. Several detectives from the city are at work on the case. Constable Sean of Lebanon set sure that he had captured the right man, but he was afterwards released from custody. The clue, which the detectives are working on in the footprint, having the appearance of a new gum boot and measuring about 10 inches and a piece of the twine with which the unfortunate woman was strangled to death. 
In talk this afternoon with one of the detectives who is working on the case, he expressed the opinion believed by the majority of the people who read the story of the crime, that either the guilty party does not live a thousand miles from the Strominger homestead, or else he had been in the habit of visiting the place so often that he had become fully aware of the habits and financial standing of the old people and knew of the old gentleman's prosperity for keeping large sums of propensity for keeping large sums of money about the house he knew that mrs strominger had co- he knew that mr strominger had collected a large amount of interest on money loaned to parties in the neighborhood and resolved upon a plan to produce without of course anticipating such a disastrous result as murder there are several people being shadowed and in the detective's opinion it is only a question of a short time until the man's wanted will be brought to justice Another article says the York County tragedy special special dispatch to the morning news, Harrisburg, April 3rd, 1891. It is rumored here that the men that killed old Mrs. Strominger in Lewisbury, York County on Tuesday night and robbed Mr. Strominger for $1,700 have been captured, and they are relatives of the old couple who knew all about their ways and the money that had been hoarded. And then the article everyone was waiting for. The murderers arrested. The slayers of Mrs. Strominger are placed behind the bars. Daniel Smith, who was arrested in Harrisburg, reveals the whole plot, and his brother, captured in York. Special dispatch to the morning news. Harrisburg, April 8, 1891. Daniel Smith, who was arrested in the city last night for complicity in the Strominger murder and robbery at Lewisbury, York County, last week, is still in jail. He is very much frightened and has revealed the whole plot, which was his own conception. He says illnesses at the time of the tragedy prevented him from taking an active part in the crime. Smith has been a resident of this city since last May, and he has not borne a good reputation. He came here from Lewisbury, where his father and brother reside. The latter, he says, assisted in the robbery. Smith had $200 of the stolen money on his person when he was arrested. William Payton, he said, is to have been the man who entered the house, and a nephew of Mrs. Strominger did the deed. York, April 8th. Daniel Smith's brother, Joseph, was arrested at Lewisbury tonight and locked up in a jail in this city. He is very recent guarding the Strominger case. Another article. Peyton's doom. The strangler meets his death on the gallows. Old Mrs. Strominger's murderer pays the penalty. A man of remarkable nerve, his last day spent in blasphemy and hilarity. In a current still fresh in the minds of the Heralds, many readers in this robbery of the Strominger's residence in Lewisbury, York County. The robbery was committed on the night of March 31, 1891, and Mrs. Strominger, an aged woman, suffered death by strangulation at the hands of one of the burglars who had gagged her. Suspicion rested on William Payton. He was arrested, tried, and convicted on Thursday, June 16, 1892, and he was hanged in the county's prison at York. The following account of the execution and career of the murderer is taken from the York Dispatch on Thursday. William Henry Payton, convicted of the murder of Mrs. Michael Strominger, was hanged at 10.19 o'clock this morning in the corridor of the York County Jail. The conduct of the condemned man during the last days of his life has been remarkable. His last Sunday on earth, when he should have been preparing himself to go before the great judge, was spent amid hilarity instead of solemnity and supplication. While the ministry of the city were offering up fervent prayers from their pulpits for the salvation of his soul, his mind ran in other directions. On the Holy Sabbath day, when he should have been in communion with his maker, he invoked the nurses and to the notes of a guitar in the hands of a colored man indulged in Chesperian exercises. As Nero fiddled with a smile on his face, and while Rome burned, so Peyton danced and indulged in hilarity while few moments left him on earth ebbed away. He danced until sheer exhaustion overcame him, and he did not stop until he was on the verge of falling over. On Monday, he exhibited no signs of despondency. To those admitted his cell, he indulged in the most wicked blasphemy. He denounced the court, jury, and everyone connected with the dissipation of justice. He freely expressed his unbelief in a future state and said that if there was a just God, he would not allow him to suffer that he did the past 14 months. He still exhibited the same indifference to all of his fate and blasphemed in unmeasured terms, everyone connected with his conviction, and said that when he died he expected to go straight to Hades, if there was such a place. And then we have an article about Mr. Michael Strominger. Michael Strominger dead, 
Michael Strominger, the husband of Mrs. Elizabeth Strominger, who was murdered nearly three years ago, died at his residence in Lewisbury, York County, on Sunday evening from the grip. William Payton was hanged for the murder, and his accomplices, the Smith brothers, are serving long terms in the Eastern Penitentiary. Payton, Payton was captured by Chief Anderson and Detective Abe Rote at his mother's home in the wilds of Sullivan County. And then this is going back to the article about Peyton being hung. On Wednesday, he still exhibited the same bold front and wickedness of the heart, and he had written to his aged mother not to come, but last evening she arrived from Stonetown, Sullivan County, and paid a visit to her son in the jail. The meeting was the most affecting one, and many hardened cases serving terms in the jail were moved to tears. His last night on earth. In Peyton's own language, last night was the most pleasant night he had passed since he was in the York County Jail. He passed the night in pleasant conversation, um, touching on a wide variety of topics, and he expressed himself as having a slight hopes of being saved. He passed considerable time in reading. At five minutes before three o'clock this morning, he consulted his watch, and on observing the time, he said, I don't know. I didn't know it was so late. I will have to lie down. He immediately passed into a sound slumber, which lasted until 6 o'clock in the morning. He was called twice before he got awake. He appeared to be in the best of spirits and was particularly composed. At 7 o'clock, he ate a hearty breakfast with much relish. After breakfast, his spiritual Presbyterian Church and Reverend Chaz A. Oliver of Westminster Presbyterian Church entered his cell. Shortly after the arrival of the ministers, Mrs. Payton, the aged mother of the condemned man, entered the cell. She remained until 9.20 o'clock. Affecting scenes took place in the dreary dungeon, but they were witnessed by Payton and the ministers only. When leaving the cell, she leaned on the arms of the two jail attendants, and she appeared very weak. Payton, however, was unaffected. He delivers a dangerous knife. When Dr. Rouse, the jail physician, called on Peyton this morning, he encountered the man had a surprise for him. He handed the doctor a dangerous-looking knife about a foot long made of a corset stay. The blade had been a key, was as keen as a razor. He passed it to the doctor with the remark, I just want to show the people what I could have done had I wished. I would not take my own life. I wanted to die on the scaffold like a man. The March to the Scaffold at 10, 17 o'clock, the condemned man marched boldly out of his cell, accompanied by Reverend Smith and Oliver, the two sheriffs, Finley's deputies. He walked alone and slightly in the lead of his attendants. When the scaffold was reached, Peyton increased his pace and ascended in a rapid gait. He was immediately bound and stood on the brink of eternity. He was neatly attired in a black suit of clothes, a standing collar and a black tie. <clears throat> he appeared to be perfectly composed, not a tremor being visible. When the noose was placed around his neck, a faint smile played over his face, and he was asked whether juryman Slayer or Detective Rote were present. On being informed in the negative, he said, All right, standing on the brink. Reverend Smith then said the Lord's Prayer. He conde the condemned man wore a sad expression at the words, and he said, but did not take part in it. The only words uttered by the condemned man from the time of leaving the cell until the drop fall was the inquiry about Sailor and Rote. After the delivery of the Lord's Prayer, the black cap was adjusted. The drop falls. Peyton now stood between life and death. In a moment, he would be hurried into eternity. No sooner had the cap been adjusted than the trigger was liberated, and at 10.19, two minutes after leaving the cell, the trap dropped from under him. A dull thud was heard, and the soul of William Henry Peyton was swung off into eternity while his body dangled in the air. He hung perfectly motionless, not a limb or muscle moving. Twelve minutes after the drop fell, Dr. Rouse pronounced Peyton dead. At 10.36, the body was cut down and the remains were then prepared for burial and were shipped to his late home at Stones Snonestown at 10.53 o'clock. Peyton's remarkable nerve. Peyton displayed remarkable nerve preparatory to the execution Prison physician Rouse visited him in the cell early this morning, and he offered the condemned man liquor to stimulate him. He refused to take it. For the execution, he offered to give the doomed man a hypodermic injection of morphia, but he coolly declined, stating that he had desired to die game. Many persons were of the belief that Peyton would cheat the gallows, he having remarked to different persons that he was not born to hang. 
Last night, members of the sporting fraternity were offering to bet that he would not hang, so firm that they were in the belief that he would take his own life. He fooled them, however. Although he had the means of self-destruction at hand, he did not do the deed. One of Peyton's special requests of the sheriff was that three persons of whom participated in the trial should not witness the execution. These persons were Constable Herman of Lewisbury, Detective Rhoda of Harrisburg, and Juryman Sailor, none of whom were present. Peyton's Confession Eight or ten days ago, Peyton made a confession to Deputy Murphy, which in substance as follows. The robbery of the Strummingers, which resulted in Mrs. Strummingers' death, for which I am held, was planned on the Sunday previous to the time it occurred by Daniel Wesley and Frank Smith and myself on the People's Bridge at Harrisburg. The whiskers were given to me by the Smith boys on Wednesday before the robbery and supposed murder occurred. On Thursday afternoon, the day previous to the robbery, I left my home in Harrisburg about 4 o'clock and went down downtown and bought some pretzels for supper and then proceeded to Lewisbury. I am no more guilty of murdering Mrs. Strominger than you or any other living person. She died from heart disease. Several nights ago, in talking to his watch, he had related several other robberies that he had planned and that were to follow the Strominger robbery, but said to this affair. Frustrated all. The one robbery was to take place in Sullivan County, where he knew of an old couple that had considerable money concealed in their house, and the other was to occur same place not only miles from the Strominger house some place not only miles from the Strominger house. He said that the only reason they had for committing the robbery was for the want of money. Hi everybody, this is Dom Mish Miller, and I'm going to be your host of the new podcast, Nightcap with a True Crime Recap. Every week I'm going to be coming to you in the evenings with a nightcap. Usually whiskey is my favorite, and we're going to be talking about a true crime event that happened in Newburytown and the surrounding areas. So this evening we're going to be talking about a murder that happened in 1891, and it was a mystery that gripped Lewisbury for some time. Elizabeth Strominger was tragically murdered during a home invasion. Elizabeth and her husband, Michael Strominger, are my first cousins four times removed. So I'm going to be reading to you the newspaper articles and the first-hand accounts of the murder. So our first article says, Lewisbury murder. The whole upper end excited over the tragedy. Mr. Strominger tries to defend his wife but is quieted by a revolver. How Mrs. Strominger was killed. The robber tries to revive his victim but life had fled. He sends a doctor but too late. So our first article is going to say, The murder of Mrs. Michael Strominger at Lewisbury on Tuesday night has thrown the usually quiet section in a torment of excitement. And if the perpetrator of the crime was caught in the present temper of the people, it might...